So this cost of reflow is a major performance issue when it comes to mobile devices. On the desktop, again, you don't hardly ever notice it. It takes easily less than two milliseconds to render out a whole page. On the device, it can take that same page over 500 milliseconds. And we talked already about how 400 milliseconds might seem like an eternity to your users. And so to have the same complicated page can take 500 milliseconds, depending on how complicated it is for it to finish reflowing it out. Um, your user is not going to really enjoy that. And so we need to talk about two different things when it comes to reflow. We need to talk about what are some ways to reduce this cost of reflow. Um, because we can't avoid it, we have to do it sometimes. We need to figure out a way, how can we take this reflow that the device has to do and make it less expensive, make it easier for the device to, to calculate these items. Uh, and then the other thing we have to look at is, how can I reduce the number of times it has to do a reflow? Again, it's going to happen. There's no, that's just the way the browser works. But if we can efficiently write our code, if we can efficiently handle how we're managing the user interface, we can reduce the number of times reflow has to occur and kind of release some of that pressure on the device to, to keep up with the user's interaction. The simplest way to reduce the cost of reflow is to remove extraneous tags on your page. We don't have to worry about this in web development because we don't have to worry about some of the processing power getting, uh, we don't have to worry about being limited on our processing power. So the simplest way is to remove extraneous tags. Um, and here's what I mean by extraneous tags. Let me, let me show you. So here is, for example, a list, of, uh, a list of things. If you were looking at what Kevin had up on the screen before, how it had a list, and then um, each item in that list is a link to something else. Now, we think about it, in a lot of cases, we don't need those link tags there. That whole list item is what the user is going to be tapping on. The link, the, the link item is extraneous. We can just listen for the touch event on the list item. Um, let me show another example of, of an image. If I'm wanting to handle user interface, if I want to um, look at, or if I want a button on my screen that the user can interact with as an image, um, do I need a link tag around it, or can I just add the JavaScript to listen to the interaction on the image? Because um, if you think about it here now, if I remove all of these, these anchor tags, and this is just an example, there are other tags that we can consider extraneous. Um, but if I remove the, these anchor tags, I can get the same effect with less code, which means when the browser has to go through and calculate the dimensions of each of these items, it doesn't have to calculate the, the size of that anchor tag anymore. It doesn't have to calculate the size of all these anchor tags. So that's going to take off four up there and take off an extra one down here. And this is, you know, this would be really small and used again, another really useless app. So if you have a whole app full of HTML, you can go through it and find, you know, maybe you have some extra divs that are wrapping, that are wrapping things that just don't need to be there. Can you write your CSS more efficiently, set up your layout more efficiently where you don't need to do that? So again, so a little bit disclaimer here before, before I go on. Now, there's some people that, that is going to complain about this, and I'll, I'll address a little bit about that. This, this is not a rule. This is really just simply some guidance, some, kind of some of, of what I've learned. I don't, a lot of cases, I don't need all these tags. I've learned that it's really important for me after I've done to go through, like, do I need this tag here? Or is this just extraneous? Because every single extra tag that I have in there is a cost during the reflow process that's going to decrease the user's, um, it's going to decrease the quality of the user's experience. Um, and so here's this idea of semantic HTML, and, that, that, and it is that semantic HTML needs to take a backseat to efficient HTML when it comes to uh, mobile web apps, specifically through phone app. Now, semantic HTML is incredibly important. I'm not, I'm not bashing that idea at all when it comes to having your site being crawled by, by search engines or having screen readers being able to, to go through a website. It's incredibly important because if you don't have a link on the page, the search engine is not going to follow this link to somewhere else. So again, semantic HTML is incredibly important when it comes to desktop uh, experiences. However, on my phone gap application, I don't have to worry about Google going through and indexing the pages in my phone gap application. It resides on the device, not on the internet. I don't have to worry about a screen reader coming through and reading through the markup and trying to read to the user what it's doing because I know the context that the user is going to be using this application in. It's going to be on the device. And so, in these cases, uh, you can't, this is especially true for phone gap applications, you have to weigh the pros and cons when it comes to semantic HTML where you can be more efficient to reduce some of this cost of reflow. And so in addition to reducing the cost of reflow, we need to reduce uh, the number of times that a reflow occurs. And so I'm going to touch back on JavaScript animations here. So in JavaScript animation, what it's actually doing is, is changing the CSS of an element. It's changing that layout of that element. So for a JavaScript animation, we have this reflow, render, and paint process that it has to go through when it does it. And it has to do this for every single frame of the animation. So very quickly, a simple fade or a simple slide of an element on a page is turned into this incredibly massive set of calculations that the mobile device has to compute in a short period of time. And what do these transitions take? Maybe a second, maybe less? 
Um, and it's taking 500 milliseconds, possibly, for the device to complete one reflow. It doesn't take long before the device just totally botches this effect and JavaScript animation really does not look all that great. So what's, the, so what's uh, a solution for this? Um, well, with CSS3, we have this uh, new idea of what's called CSS transitions and animations. Um, and the spec is written such that, that when you animate an item three using CSS, it works directly on the painted layer that's already on the screen. It doesn't, the, the specification that it doesn't need to go back and reflow out the page. And so the result is a much nicer experience, especially on an iPhone or an iPad, because anything that happens on the paint layer, this is system-wide, but especially for HTML and CSS JavaScript. Anything that happens on the paint layer of the device is hardware accelerated, which means that it just looks a lot nicer. When you, uh, when you do it. Um, and so, I'm not gonna dive in too deep to what a CSS animation is, but very simply, this is, this is what an animation looks like inside a CSS. I define my keyframes, I've named my animation rule, we're gonna find out why in just a second, and I'm saying, I wanna move from zero pixels on the screen, I wanna move it over 200 pixels, and then turn it over 180 degrees. And so, if I were to look at what that looks like on the, on the device, back out here, open up through, is that what I'm on? Yeah. So essentially that's all it does, it's a little animation of a box moving back and forth. And if you want to see what this looks like on the actual device, uh, I can show it to you, it's a little hard for me to hold up my device and for everyone to see it here, so I put it on a simulator uh, to get an idea. But this CSS trans transition animation, they're very powerful, they can let you do a lot of things, and they, they result in some really nice looking animations. Um, now the specification, uh, Kevin mentioned this earlier, the specification for CSS3 is not complete, uh, and there are still some bugs. So again, it's a little bit of a caveat here. Sometimes animations do flicker, and this is gonna take some practicing. I mean, this is no different than developing for any other platform. You have to go through and learn what's the most efficient way for me to do this. If it doesn't work this way, what's another way I can write it? So it's gonna take some creative problem solving. But again, that's no different than any other device. Okay, so one of the things that makes Phone, Gra phone Gap so great, um, you know, some of these performance tips that I've been going through, this is great for just any sort of mobile web application. Even if you're never thinking about deploying your application to the market stores, uh, the app store or anything like that, even if it's just going to reside on a web page that you just go to in the browser. The tips that I've given so far are really helpful because um, they, you know, they, this is uh, applicable to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on a mobile device, regardless of whether you're going to wrap it up in PhoneGap. But what PhoneGap does is give you another leg up uh, on, a standard HT, and on a standard mobile uh, web page because it provides the PhoneGap API which lets you do things that a normal mobile web app wouldn't be able to do. For example, a normal mobile web app would not be able to access the camera on your device. It wouldn't be able to access the accelerometer. It has some geolocation built in. That's part of the HTML5 specification. Uh, it wouldn't be able to access the device contacts. If you wanted to send an email to someone, it wouldn't be able to pull up the, the list of the device contacts that you have on that device. Another thing, that the PhoneGap API does is that it provides a level uh, of abstraction between the device and your code through JavaScript. Uh, what this means is that uh, if you need to access the camera on the device for your application, it's the same code in both iPhone and, and Android because the PhoneGap API takes care of the differences of the underlying code in between. So for example, if we were looking at uh, getting a picture from say the user's camera roll, this is directly off of the PhoneGap documentation for their API and the code is I need to use navigator.camera.getPicture, uh, and I can pass in a callback function for when this call is successful, a callback for when the call fails, uh, and then some options such as what quality you want the picture to be, um, or you know, things like that. So I have this set up in both an iPhone and an Android application to get a picture out of my camera roll. So I launch up the application. This application is using uh, jQuery mobile that uh, Kevin looked at a little bit earlier. This is a kitchen sink project, I didn't write this project, this is available online. Uh, and so I can pull up the camera, you saw that there, it looks nice, this, that is a CSS3 transition there. Uh, click on gallery, opens up my gallery, take a picture, there we go. No different from a normal app that you would look at uh, on a device. And so if I were to do this exact same code, exact same set of code on the Android, whoops, we don't need to see that again. Open up this application, it's going to look the exact same once it starts up here. Come on, Android emulator. The Android emulator is incredibly slow. Try this again. All right. Try one more creative thing here. Kitchen sink. 
sure. Let's try building out again for the device. I'll spoil the ending here. It works the same way in any way as the iPhone. <laughs> I can joke, yeah, if you really want to say that one, it won't respond right now. But. All right. So back on over here, where we left off. All right, so the idea is it's the exact same code on the, on the Android emulator, on the Android as it is on, the, on iOS devices, and it even works on other devices that supports um, the camera. Maybe it's a Blackberry device or something like that. So the PhoneGap API supports a whole host, a whole host of different functions across different platforms. Um, PhoneGap website has a very similar grid. Uh, mine's a little bit different from theirs based off of my own experience. The PhoneGap API is growing very rapidly and as I experience differences with it, sometimes they don't update their website as fast and so this might differ a little bit. But the idea is, I've uh, seen on, on iOS, iOS supports pretty much all these features with the accelerometer, camera, compass, context, file, geolocation, audio recording, sound notification, vibration, or database storage. Now there's a few things such as file storage and audio recording. It doesn't work very efficiently, there might be some bugs in it, they're still working on getting it done. Um, they're still in pre-release right now, so hopefully by version one we'll have excuse me, some of those worked out. Same with Android, there's some features with getting contacts. You can get a contact, you can't always add a contact uh, reliably, or sometimes the data storage isn't as reliable as it wants to be. As, as we move down some of the other devices, they don't support as many of the features. Sometimes it's just because they don't have it. For example, BlackBerry, uh, the WebOS phones, and the Symbian phones, they just don't have a compass in them, at least not any of the ones that, uh, that PhoneGap supports. Um, some of them don't support audio recording as it is, and some devices don't even support. Uh, so some, some of them are just limitations of the actual device. Some of them are just the PhoneGap code has not been written for yet. So as you look over this, you'll notice that it doesn't cover every single feature of the device. For example, iOS has some very specific features to it. Uh, such as being able to send local notifications. I want to pop up alert on the user's home screen while they're using another application. Or I want to change uh, that little badge number that appears on the icon saying there's an alert in this application and I want you to look at it. These are very specific to the iOS platform and you don't see those in the other platforms so it wouldn't make a lot of sense for PhoneGap to build it into their API. But like I alluded to earlier, they have this PhoneGap plugin architecture that lets you write your own plugins that can support that code. Uh, now, what's really great about the PhoneGap community is that it's very vibrant, and a lot of these plugins have already been written for you. So if you're trying to do uh, uh, a feature or a function that, that's pretty common, such as updating the badge number or you know, Google Analytics or opening up a, opening up a web page within your, uh, within your app, uh, there are plugins that have already been written for that, and you can just drop them into your project, and they have instructions of how to do that. Uh, or maybe you have a complicated feature that hasn't been implemented, maybe you need to do some advanced image editing under the scenes or something like that. You might need to write the code yourself for that. What makes PhoneGap so great is that even though there are some things that maybe JavaScript can't handle, maybe it's not the, maybe it's not the best at handling it. So for example, I would not want to go through and apply filters to an image uh, using JavaScript. It would just not be efficient. I could build my interface in, Java, in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, but I would want the actual heavy lifting to be done by, for example, Objective-C or by Java, where I get more finite control over how the device is handling that. Uh, now the caveat there is that I would have to write that plugin for both Objective-C and in Java. You do have to write it in the native language when you're writing a plugin and then write the communication pathway between uh, the device and uh, the JavaScript. So it's a lot better than writing your entire application cross-platform there.